Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our last uh, Grand Rounds of March 2017. We're very honored this morning to have Dr. Daniel Davidovich uh, speak to us. But before I get to the introduction, I want to just mention to you next week at this time and in this at this station, we will be having our annual Howard Virtual Memorial Lecture. And the speaker this year is Dr. Robert Harrington, uh, Chairman of Medicine at at uh, uh, Stanford University in California. And his topic has changed given the recent interest in um, uh, the electronic medical record and using digital information as research. He, he is going to speak to us now on rethinking randomized controlled trials and what they're doing at Stanford in this uh, respect. And we'll be able to compare with us uh, our work after his talk. So please join us next week. This morning, um, we have one of our distinguished uh, cardiology fellows, Dan Davidovich, who many of you know. He uh, graduated from medical school at UCI Medical School in San Jose, Costa Rica, and uh, finished his internal medicine residency at uh, Hennepin County Medical Center in 2015 and has joined us as a fellow. Dan has been quite active in research, especially in pulmonary artery monitoring and has published several manuscripts and abstracts, one of which is now under review, and uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. So this morning, Dan would like to address us on the use of his work with uh, Steve Goldsmith. Where are you, Steve? Steve Goldsmith at, from Hennepin County uh, has been collaborating with Dan in the use of the implantable pulmonary artery pressure monitoring device to prevent heart failure readmissions. Welcome, Dan. Well, you're all wired? I'm wired. I think I'm on now. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm hoping to talk to you guys a little bit about the background of uh, this concept and this technology and uh, give you guys some information on what we've been doing locally as well. Um, part of the disclosures our research that we did here that I'll address was supported by a grant from St. Jude Medical. Um, I do have an agenda, um, and ideally what we would discuss today is uh, why this is relevant, why is heart failure relevant, why are the heart failure admissions relevant, and why we should even be talking about it. Um, we'll go over a little bit about what exactly we're talking about. Um, I'll very, very briefly go over uh, the current knowledge, the data uh, that's out there, not so much analyzing each paper or anything like that, but more focusing on what the consensus is so far and what this might be helpful for. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about our results, our local data, which includes both Abbott, Hennepin, and some other facilities that we'll see. Um, and I'll tell you guys what I think, which is not necessarily the most important part. Um, but then I also uh, want to hear uh, about uh, what you think, both, both in the form of comments and questions, and uh, also hopefully uh, give a chance uh, to our heart failure folks to, to give us a little perspective about how they feel things have been going with this uh, here and uh, who would be good patients to be uh, referred for this. Um, so just a little background, and this is uh, just some data borrowed from the heart disease and stroke statistics update from 2010. Uh, I hope I didn't have to convince anybody that heart failure is important, but just in case, um, we can see that it's a disease that affects many. Um, and then if we focus on the bottom couple of uh, points there, um, you can see that it leads to a lot of hospitalizations and a lot of utilization encounters. Um, so it's certainly something that's affecting a lot of people uh, right now. Um, and uh, here we have a few more details on hospitalization. Um, and, you know, the, the numbers are high. One out of every five almost patients are going to be re-hospitalized within 30 days, almost a third within 90 days. Um, and then this particular uh, special article um, estimated that the cost could be up to $17.4 billion in 2004. So it, it's certainly um, a lot of money. And if you go back to that 2010 update, uh, I 
put an arrow there so you guys can see that in 2010, the total estimated cost, and that is total, um, was just over $39 billion. So even though hospitalizations don't account for everything when it comes to heart failure, they're certainly a big piece of the pie. And, and, and uh, as you all know, there's big efforts to reduce hospitalizations and rehospitalizations in these patients. And uh, everybody's looking at different approaches. Um, now, to just kind of review what we'll be talking about today, um, this is a clinical tool. We think it'll improve heart failure management if, uh, if we give it to, to someone who hopefully builds up some experience on this, has some knowledge about heart failure management. Um, but obviously, this is not going to be a magic solution. This is not autopilot. Um, we do not want to be the person there on the cockpit trying to go through the instructions as we're trying to figure it out. Um, it's just one more tool that we have at our disposition. Um, to kind of understand exactly what we're looking at here, um, I always like to look at the history whenever I'm preparing a presentation and, you know, that putting something inside a blood vessel to measure a pressure is not a novel idea. It's something that has evolved over many, many years. Um, I think uh, Werner Forsman there is probably the most famous one. He's the one that walked down to the uh, to get his x-ray after putting a catheter in and confirming that it was in the RA. Um, but essentially around the 1970s is uh, when I think we started really talking about PA pressure monitoring in the clinical setting. Um, so at that point, the thought was that, you know, you have this invasive strategy that can help you guide your patient's management by giving you some hemodynamic data. Um, but for a long, long time, this was pretty much thought of as something that was a tool in the ICU or some higher level of care where you could um, take care of very sick patients um, and you needed that extra data. Over time, sort of a separate uh, parallel thought process uh, came up with people thinking, well, what else could we use uh, continuous pulmonary artery pressure monitoring for? Um, is it something that we can only use in the ICU? Could we come up with a way where, you know, we kind of take that uh, Swan Gans catheter at the bottom, put it through our Space Age gadget machine, and turn it into something very futuristic that's non-invasive that we can use to manage patients chronically, even when they're healthy and at home, or feeling good, I should say. Um, and somebody came up with the idea of heart failure and congestion, but not congestion as we know it. Um, they did not mean the congestion that you see um, when, when your patient comes in and they've got, you know, an S3 or, or they can't breathe, they've got pulmonary edema, they've got peripheral edema. That's not really the congestion that people were thinking about so much, but it was more of a subclinical congestion. Can we get ahead of the curve in some way um, and try to help people? Now, congestion is is not exactly the focus of, uh, of most heart failure trials these days. You know, there's all these other pathways that are, have been explored, and we've come up with a lot of different medications that don't necessarily focus on congestion, but that help heart failure patients. But when it comes to congestion, congestion is the reason why patients, for the most part, become symptomatic. Um, and when patients become symptomatic, that's when their quality of life is affected. That's when they wind up in the hospital. Um, and that's when we wind up having to aggressively diurese them because they're so congested. Um, it's got adverse effects on the heart, the kidney, and overall there's poor outcomes if your patient is constantly getting readmitted because of congestion. Um, now we do have some strategies in place. Um, we keep trying to see the heart failure patients more and more often in clinic, you know, as you can see from that nice couple there. Um, People have looked at biomarkers, and there's all sorts of theories that in part are panning out where if you measure biomarkers, you can get some prognostic information about heart failure. But it's still hard to know how to act upon that information. Um, we've got a scale there. I think everybody is giving away free scales and having people weigh themselves. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a useful tool for a long time, but it's something that also a lot of times leaves us uh, in the dark uh, and patients still get readmitted. And then there's been a big push for telemonitoring strategies, and 
I've actually looked at some monitoring strategies to see if we can implement one up the street. The data is, you know, it's not great data. Um, it's certainly a way to get the patients engaged, but you're still using, uh, you know, weight, maybe blood pressure and heart rate. You're using things that we have tried and that we know don't always help us get ahead of that curve. Um, so a great way to get a motivated patient engaged in their care, um, but not necessarily something that statistically has helped people um, from, a, from an epidemiologic standpoint. Um, so I keep talking about getting ahead of the, the curve, and this poor gentleman isn't even sure which curve he's supposed to stay ahead of. And I think for a lot of time, we weren't quite sure which curve to stay ahead of either. Um, so eventually here, this is, a, uh, this is from a paper in 2003, and I borrowed this graph from Dr. Goldsmith. Um, I hope I put it back together right, because when I was moving it around, all the numbers shifted. But I think everything's back in the same place. Um, and this is the curve that we want to get ahead of. And let me point it right here. This is already, you know, this line signifies where the pressure change happens. These are baseline measurements of RV pressure, estimated PA diastolic pressure, and heart rate. And what you can see, oops, sorry, what you can see here is that right where this first dotted line is, um, you start to get a pressure change. Now, the heart rate, the heart rate did not change. It stayed the same. Um, but the RV pressure and the estimated PA pressure started to go up. Um, and eventually, they went up enough where the patient wound up getting hospitalized. And uh, what they saw back then was that you could tell a significant percent difference. This is all in percentage of change. Um, well before, several days before the patient was actually hospitalized. So this sort of definition of... Uh, hemodynamic congestion rather than clinical congestion um, is more what we try to address um, before you get to clinical congestion or clinical symptoms. Um, so just very, very briefly to go over the hemodynamics, normally you would think of your LV filling pressure being similar to your pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, and we've got kind of the whole uh, string there. Um, and the, the theory here was if you can implant a PA pressure sensor, uh, you'll get information on your LV filling pressures. Now, there's obviously some exceptions. Every patient's going to be a little different, and you're going to have different uh, comorbidities that are going to affect this measurement. If you've got a patient with severe mitral stenosis, um, you know, you're not getting a, 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 your LV EDP measurement. So, again, it's not an autopilot. We still have to pick people uh, accordingly, but overall, the list of things was not terribly long. Um, just also as a side note, RV pressure uh, doesn't directly reflect, reflect the LV pressure, but there has been at least one device uh, that came up with a form of algorithm to estimate your PA pressures based off of your RV pressures, um, and we'll very briefly touch on that as well. Um, so here are uh, the devices that I know about. Um, we have got the Chronicle from Medtronic. That's the one that we just mentioned. Um, you can see the picture there at the bottom. It, it looks just like a pace, or very similar to a pacemaker with one lead. Um, and essentially, that lead would go to the RV, and it would measure RV pressures. And it had this algorithm. I believe it used the EKG as well. And uh, it would figure out um, what the PA, or it would estimate what the PA pressures were. Now, when they, uh, when they researched this, um, they did not meet their endpoints for their trial, and they did not get FDA approval, but it was sort of a, a proof of concept type of thing where they did see a trend where uh, if you could estimate the PA pressures, you'd have a predictive value um, of who was going to get admitted. Um, now, the device was invasive. It could be logistically complicated, especially in a heart failure patient where you already might have a lead the RA and the RV, so it starts to get crowded. You don't want to keep putting leads in there. Um, so that's sort of fallen out of favor. Um, then we've got the heart pot from St. Jude, and there's an image of it as well. And then there's a couple of x-ray images so you can see uh, what it looks like when it's being delivered there on the top, and then when it's actually in place uh, on the bottom. Um, this was also 
fairly complex. It was invasive. It, the, the wording I find is that it cinched onto the interatrial septum. Um, it also had this sort of box, like a like a like a pacemaker would or something. Um, but it did measure your left atrial pressure, and if you think about it, that's pretty much as close as you're going to get to estimating LVEDP without actually measuring your LVEDP. Uh, now they had this trial, the laptop heart failure, and the results, from what I saw in, in my side and, and what I could see people were commenting on it, is that the results were encouraging, but the benefit you were getting was very similar to uh, estimating PA pressure. And if you can, if, with a CardioMEMS device, and if you can do that, uh, if you can just measure the pulmonary artery pressure and get similar results in a much less invasive way and in a much less complex procedure, um, why not do that? So the sense I get is that the, the laptop heart, heart failure data is going to help PA pressure monitors more than LA pressure monitors, so to speak. Um, and then we've got the one we use. Um, and it's really the one that's cornering the market at this point, but every other company is working on something. Um, but this is definitely the one that's cornering, cornering the market right now. Um, it gives you pulmonary artery pressure measurements. It's in the pulmonary artery. It directly measures um, pulmonary artery pressure. Um, it's a catheter-based delivery system. So uh, in my mind, what the risk of the procedure and the complexity of the procedure is kind of right heart cathish. Um, you do a right heart cath as part of the procedure, um, but then on top of that, you deploy the device into one of the pulmonary arteries. Um, the device is wireless. Um, it uses radio frequency to get its power and its communication. There's no battery changes. Um, so from an engineering standpoint, it's certainly a very interesting device. Um, I promise you guys that's a dime on that picture. I didn't go around the world looking for the biggest coin I could find. It's a fairly small device. Um, and if you see those strands that sort of come out of it, um, those are what keeps it in place uh, when it's embolized into the pulmonary artery. And thanks to that, uh, I think the estimation of how much it blocks is about 10% of the pulmonary artery. So you're still going to get flow through that pulmonary artery, which is one of the frequent questions, you know, are you going to get a, a pulmonary uh, infarct? And so far, I haven't seen reports of a pulmonary infarct. And um, from what I could read, it's estimated that it's completely endothelialized uh, within three to four months. Um, there is a little anticoagulation that goes with actually deploying the device, I believe, for about one month after. Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, and then on the bottom there, you can see uh, what the patients use is that pillow that's on the left. And uh, it's attached to that box, and the patient lays on that pillow every morning. Uh, you get radio frequency from that pillow to the device. The device gets activated, and it transmits the pressures. Um, and then the pressures can be seen on an online suite, you know, um, through a web page that they grant access to the medical provider. Um, and then on the right, you've got the one, the one that's with sort of a, a wand, uh, kind of what you think of with the EP devices, and that one's more for use in the hospital. Um, there we've got a chest x-ray with the device deployed. The chest x-ray did not come labeled, so I hope I put the arrow in the right spot. But as you can see, it's, it's a very tiny device. Uh, you can confirm that it was placed in the right spot with a chest x-ray. Um, and then what you get, uh, what you see as a provider after the device has been implanted and you're managing the patient is uh, what we have there on the right. Um, that's a, an image from the online suite and essentially uh, you have your dates on your x-axis, uh, your pressures on your y-axis, and you follow that along. It gives you a systolic, a diastolic, and a mean. And then <clears throat> you can see shaded in blue we've got what was set up as a normal range for this person. Uh, you can set up alerts on this online suite and say if we get this much percent change or if we go over this number, uh, somebody needs to get an inbox and act on it right away. Um, as long as there's no alerts, I think for the most part people are looking uh, after several days or maybe even a couple of weeks because really here what you want to see is that trend um, more than the specific number. You can see that there's 
a lot of variability in the line day to day, but the overall trend uh, sticks. So the idea here is to look at that trend, to have a lot of, uh, to have data at least every day, and uh, as soon as you start to see a climb in that line, then you know it's a time for a change. It's a time to change your diuretic dose um, to prevent clinical congestion, where when you're still at the just hemodynamic congestion point uh, of the course. Um, so skipping ahead to our current knowledge. Um, and I'll try to be quick. The idea is not to uh, analyze every paper in detail, but essentially uh, most of the data came from the CHAMPION trial. Um, and the CHAMPION trial was a randomized single-blind trial. And they were able to find that you had a reduction in heart failure-related admissions um, with a fairly low complication rate. Um, and the complications included things like hematoma, uh, there was a thrombus that formed on the delivery uh, catheter for one patient. There was, I believe, one device that had to be snared back after deployment, but there was really no pulmonary infarct, no deaths, um, nothing really serious. Um, and then after that, uh, eventually the device was uh, approved by the FDA, and this is uh, taken directly from the FDA webpage. And Surprisingly enough, they gave us a fairly uh, flexible and wide indication. Um, they just said, you know, class three heart failure symptoms uh, who have been hospitalized for heart failure in the previous year. Um, does that mean every patient with heart failure is going to get one of these? Because almost every patient with heart failure could meet this indication. No, that's not the idea. But it's it's nice that we got a nice flexible indication so that we can actually analyze each case and focus on the clinical side of things um, and have some flexibility on the indication side of things. Um, since then, there's been several papers, for the most part, uh, using that same data. Um, one thing that has caught a lot of people's eye is uh, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients. Uh, some of the data looks better in the hep -PEP population than in the hep -REP population, which is something that doesn't always happen in heart failure trials. Um, and I think part of that is that we're really focusing on congestion. Uh, a lot of the other interest interventions for heart failure that focus on mortality and all these things, um, your hep -PEP population, is, is, it's always hard to get the right people. Um, they have several different comorbidities, and they're just a complex population. Whereas when you're focusing on congestion, symptom management, and preventing readmission, um, it, you're talking about the same process. Um, they also looked specifically at people with uh, COPD and pulmonary disease. Uh, that was a big question. You know, you're measuring pulmonary artery pressures. What's going to happen with people who have pulmonary disease that can affect those pressures? Um, but the results seem to pan out with that as well. Um, their initial data uh, had very little follow-up, so then they came out with uh, more prolonged follow-up data, and that was also positive. And then there's been a lot of talk about the cost effectiveness and the reimbursement uh, for this device. Initially, there was a lot of arguments about reimbursement, how to reimburse it. Uh, at this point, my understanding is that outpatient uh, placement of the device is reimbursed well enough to where you can actually afford to do it. Um, the device checks uh, are billed as a, as, as a device check, the way EP would do a, a remote device check. Um, so I think it, it's, a, it's a low dollar number. It's not exactly what's going to maintain your CardioMan program. Um, but the cost effectiveness analysis is always positive because of the prevention of readmission. And that's really where you're going to get most of your bang for your buck in the sense that these patients are not constantly coming back into the hospital with congestion, with symptoms, um, which is, of course, a, a, a hot topic right now. Um, I apologize that we didn't chat about my poster when everybody else did, but I didn't want to ruin the surprise for, <laughs> for the lecture. But we did get a chance to talk about our poster at ACC. There was a lot of interest. People were very excited. Um, and uh, you know, I think we've been, in general, as a medical community, late to adopt the technology because there's still some questions. Uh, 
mainly the questions people had were on the reimbursement and the logistics side of things. It seems like people are a little more ready to, to embrace it, but there was definitely a lot of interest, and we'll go over uh, what we found. Essentially, this is through the Minnesota Heart Failure Consortium, and uh, we have these five sites. I get the pleasure of rotating through two of them, which I've highlighted there, and uh, this is our, our own local data um, to look at what exactly we're doing in Minnesota uh, and nearby for our patients. Um, we did get a total of 137 patients, which seemed to impress some of the people at ACC. You know, I think most places have small numbers of CardioMem devices in place. And as you can see here by site, there's a lot of variability. And uh, both here and up the street at HCMC, we're not doing a high number of CardioMem devices. Uh, we had a couple of other sites that were very early adopters and that really drove the number. Um, we, um, most of the data for this is on six-month follow-up. Um, so most of our patients did have at least six months of follow-up at 91. Only about 47, we were able to get the full 365 days post-implant so that we can compare it to 365 days pre-implant. But my hope is that we'll get to keep collecting data on these people at certain intervals so that we can see how we're doing and if it's something that's really helping us. Um, one thing that significantly affected our follow-up was that we did have uh, 12 deaths in the group. Um, it was, uh, it was, the number itself was very similar to champion trials, so it's a pretty comparable uh, population probably. And uh, all but one of those deaths happened before six months, and that really pulled down our, uh, our follow-up. Um, when you look at your actual demographics, when we try to characterize these patients, I think it's sort of what we would expect from a heart failure population um, with your age in the 70 range, uh, two-thirds being male, two-thirds having a reduced ejection fraction, but we did have a, a decent amount of HEF-PEF patients that we were able to look at. Um, and then our follow-up time post-implant was somewhere around 242. Um, so this is essentially our raw data on hospital admissions and all visits. And I know it's a very busy table for which I apologize, but we really wanted to show you guys the raw data because we think the, the absolute numbers uh, really tell the story. Uh, so I've tried to put arrows there. First off, obviously, you guys probably want to know the, the local information. So that would be uh, that first arrow at site three. Um, if you go by site, this is one of the sites that unfortunately did not reach statistical significance, probably because there was a low number of events um, and there was a, a, a big change in the follow-up. But if you look at the absolute numbers and, and your heart failure admissions in these patients went down from 27 to about 11, um, which I think is a, a substantial drop, and uh, your total hospital admissions went down from 47 to 24. Uh, one thing we noticed is that uh, the non-heart failure admissions uh, did change, and the changes were a little different by site, um, and we wonder if this is also a technology that can help us uh, better classify our patients and, and just know better exactly what's going on. Maybe we're calling something heart failure when it isn't. Maybe we're calling it, you know, a bronchospasm when it's heart failure. So this is certainly something that seems to, to change some diagnoses. Um, now, uh, when we look at our total data, which really was, was the main focus of doing a multi-center approach, um, those numbers changed drastically and reached statistical significance. Your heart failure admissions across the board went from 237 down to 46, uh, which I think is a very significant drop. Um, and then your total uh, hospitalizations went down from 392 to 172. Um, when you look at total utilization, when you just look at all the visits, and for this we included ED visits where the patient was discharged from the emergency department rather than admitted, um, and when we looked at cardiac-related clinic visits, and the way we tried to figure that out was if it was a cardiology clinic visit, we went ahead and counted it. It's hard to believe someone with heart failure is going to see the cardiologist and we're not going to mention it. Um, 
but then also if they had a, 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 an appointment with their internal medicine doctor and it was about congestion, about heart failure, meds were adjusted, we tried to include those as best as we could. Um, so uh, as we were adjusting for variable follow-up, we came up with this event year rate uh, that we could look at. This is the focus on the heart failure uh, and total hospitalization uh, graph. This has really been the, the workhorse, I think, for this concept and this technology, preventing uh, hospital admissions. And uh, when you look at this, we reached statistical significant significance when we did this analysis too, and uh, your total hospital admissions dropped by about one point, and your um, heart failure-related admissions were just above 1.5, and they dropped to 0 0.5. So I, I, I think it's also a, a pretty significant result. Uh, when we looked at our other types of encounters, one of the questions people sometimes have is, am I just shifting my, my utilization? Uh, granted, a clinic visit is always going to be better than being in the hospital for four days, but it is a question people have. Am I just kind of moving things around and shifting from here to there? Um, and, you know, the patient's quality of life is going to be the same because they're always at a clinic instead of always at the hospital. And what we found is that your cardiac clinic visits didn't, uh, didn't have a statistically significant change. And when you looked at the absolute numbers, there also wasn't a, a big change. So that was reassuring. Um, as I was doing the data collection, I got the, and this is anecdotal, obviously, you can't compare this, but um, what I noticed is that there was maybe, you know, more than clinic visits and hospital admissions, there was some phone calls. Hey, you got to take an extra Lasix today because your PA pressure is going up, um, which seems something that is very doable to prevent an admission. Uh, one point that we found curious here and that goes into the, the classification uh, of patients is that our heart failure ED visits were unchanged, but our total ED visits were decreased with statistical significance. So again, wondering if uh, some things were being called heart failure when maybe they weren't. Um, so very briefly, my thoughts uh, on the subject, kind of going through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, it's a new technology, so whenever there's a new technology, even though we, we believe in, in data-driven uh, medicine, I feel like there's also a point to, does this idea make sense to me? And sometimes things are counterintuitive, but it's kind of nice when the idea makes sense. You know, we use this in the inpatient since the 70s, and yes, there's some controversy in the acutely ill, but if we can monitor this, it's, it's, it's an idea that makes sense. Um, and the data that we've been able to get on it so far has supported the strategy as being viable, decreasing admissions, um, which would be good for both patients and the, the healthcare system. Um, I get the sense that the device is safe compared to a lot of our other interventions. Um, they are still reporting all adverse effects online and you can go in and look at them and there's really uh, not been a lot. Compared to the original trial, there has been a couple of episodes of the device not sensing, which is obviously frustrating to go through the whole procedure and then still not have the data. but. I believe that number is still very, very low. Um, and then if, if you think about it, if you're preventing hospitalizations, um, you could potentially have improved clinical outcomes. I don't know that we have the data to say that yet, to say that people are going to live longer. Um, but it's, it's an idea towards the future of something to look at. Um, I have very little doubt that it would improve quality of life if you're not getting symptoms and not getting admitted, but rather you're at home and Every once in a while you get a phone call from the clinic saying to adjust your medication. That seems like very personalized medicine to me. Um, and then it would decrease the overall cost of heart failure management in my mind. Now there's been a lot of controversy in that regard, especially with the, with the low reimbursement. But I, again, I think the focus is on preventing those readmissions, especially with the way that's being reimbursed nowadays uh, or not reimbursed. Um, it's, it's certainly become a priority for a lot of places. And I, even though the motivation was initially financial, I think it's not a bad thing for us to constantly think, you know, if this patient was just in the hospital, what am I going to do uh, as I discharge them to make sure that they get to stay home and they get to enjoy their time rather than keep coming back? Um, I get the sense that there 
will also be a little more engagement from patients, those patients that are really seeking to get a little more control over their situation, those patients that really want to help themselves and sometimes can't figure out, why am I getting symptoms? Why am I getting congested again? Why am I back in the hospital? You know, they get to every day lay on the pillow, send the data. They feel like they're helping themselves, helping the cause overall. And, and I think they are. And hopefully doing that every morning and seeing some results would continue to motivate people and engage them even more um, when it comes to their heart failure care. Um, there's some other possible very specialized uses. And when I was asking around about how this was used, I heard comments on, for example, a pre-transplant patient who had prohibitive pulmonary artery pressure for a transplant. Uh, so they actually monitored their PA pressure with this device until it, it was low enough with uh, maximum tolerated therapies where they were actually candidates for a few more things. Um, so overall, I think this is a great clinical tool. Again, it's, it's, I think some people want to see a magic solution with heart failure, but I think this is a, a great extra tool uh, for those that are managing heart failure patients to try and intervene a little sooner than we're intervening now. Uh, now there's always the bat and uh, some patients get nervous about things that are permanently implanted in their body and for good reason. You know, if you told me you're going to put some microchip in me forever and I didn't know anything about it, I might think about it twice. Um, I don't think we have the data yet to make assumptions about mortality. I, you, you every once in a while hear people talking about it or see it in the comments. Um, I don't know that we're there, but um, hopefully we'll continue to look at it and figure out if this is just something that's going to help symptoms and readmissions or if we're actually going to help people live longer as well. Um, there was a lot of questions, uh, you know, when I was talking to people at ACC about this. Who is the right patient for this? And I think everybody thinks of, you know, their, their complex patient that keeps getting readmitted. Um, and, and that's fine, but the main thing is going to be if noncompliance is your driver, if your patient did not want to take their Lasix for whatever reason, uh, they might still not want to take their Lasix uh, even though you give them the PA pressure. Um, and, you know, so, some people, life sometimes get in, gets in the way of their health care, and if they have something important to do, and that's why they don't take their LASIK because they can't go to the restroom, you're going to give them a number, but some of them will still not want to take it. And, you know, that's not the patient where this is a good idea, probably. Um, it's more for your patients that are motivated, but that are just difficult uh, or complex patients that are difficult to manage as an outpatient. Um, another comment I heard from one of our PAs of the street is he has one patient who he has to call and, and talk into getting the data, into laying on the pillow and actually sending in the transmissions. And that's where the patient engagement is going to come in. If, if you've got a patient that's got terrible depression, uh, be, either because of their disease process or because they already had it or developed it, developed it after. And, and uh, you know they're depressed, they don't feel like they want to take care of themselves, and they don't actually uh, lay down on the pillow and send the transmission in, you're kind of going to be sitting in the same spot, but you will have paid for a nice, fancy electronic. Um, and then the, the, the one big logistic limitation is going to be chest thickness. So uh, the patients actually get measured. You know, It's not by weight or by body surface area or BMI or any of the things we're used to using but you just measure the thickness of their chest uh, to make sure that your, your device is going to be able to transmit um, through that tissue. Um, so those are, I think, kind of the, the main things on, on the bad side. The complication rate has luckily not been limiting. We'll obviously learn more about it, and it's something to keep our eye on, but it seems like that's not going to be the main issue. Um, the ugly, the device I didn't think had too many ugly things, but having to listen to me at 7 in the morning might be. Um, unless you're that guy on the right, in which case you were on call, is the only reason I can think you would have been up all night and not gone to sleep. Um, in which case you should be getting ready to go to sleep soon. Uh, but I didn't find anything too ugly about it. Again, the, the worst thing would have been complications from the actual uh, placement of the device uh, that led to death, and that was not a thing. Um, then thinking about the future directions, again, the idea here is not necessarily that this device is the future. 
Um, but the concept and the proof of concept is very reassuring. Um, now, whenever I talk about this, uh, people tell me, well, yeah, it's always going to be the future. It's kind of the, the, one of the cardiology unicorns. But uh, I think at this point, every company is looking at non-invasive technologies. Um, anybody who's heard me talk about this knows that I always mention this first one, the Kova by Two Cents. That one's, you know, out from the West Coast, and it looks very fashionable. And uh, essentially, it's, you know, it's this kind of necklace that people put on, and uh, they send their they, that sends the, estimates their PA pressures and sends it to an online suite. Um, so you're basically thinking about doing the same thing in a non-invasive way, which would obviously be fantastic and would allow us to use this technology for a lot more people. Um, there's other things. I, I, I found this one, for example, the sensor vest. With that, with that one, I get the sense that it's more about total fluid volume in the chest, and uh, uh, it's it's not pressure monitoring. It's things that we've looked at before with ICDs and pacemakers, uh, but it's non-invasive things that are out there. These are the ones that you can find very easily on an online search, but there's been other work. There's people who are using sound to try to detect an S3 uh, before you can hear it with a stethoscope. There's uh, all sorts of uh, different ideas for non-invasive approaches out there, and I think whoever, whoever makes it to a non-invasive approach first um, it's really going to be on to something. Um, and then now I was hoping to get uh, Dr. Goldsmith and maybe someone from Abbott who's had some experience with this uh, about what has been the thought process so far on uh, how to use this device. Are people that have gotten to use it happy? Which patients should we be thinking about referring for this device? And uh, that type of thing. Well, thanks, Dan. <clears throat> <clears throat> Those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Goldsmith, and I am the director of the Heart Failure Consortium, as well as the program up at uh, Hennepin. Um, I do want to congratulate Dan on putting this together. We got this grant, obviously, to the consortium uh, from St. Jude, but Dan really did about 85%, I'd say, of the legwork in getting all of this uh, study, uh, for our study, together, and uh, apparently had a nice time presenting the results last week at the ACC while I was out in Bryce Canyon or someplace out, out west, but uh, I heard good things about, about the presentation. Um, I think this is spectacular technology. I mean, we were in the champion trial, and I've been excited by this for, for, for as long as we've, we've known about it. And, and the reason is that it's a vindication that hemodynamics matter. You know, Scott Sharkey and I together for about 15 years did most of the CCU work at Hennepin in the day when we put in a lot of swans, and we know how valuable it was. I think the pendulum is swinging back to using more swans. I hope so because I think it's very useful in the acute setting. But the idea that you could actually prevent admissions by knowing the PA pressure made sense to me from the beginning, because hemodynamics matter. And they matter even more in the neurohormonal paradigm, which we've developed and exploited, obviously, because you put everybody on these drugs, and of course you improve survival, but in the day-to-day -day and week-to-week, -week, they still come in the hospital, and that's a hemodynamic event. And so knowing the hemodynamics and acting on it can make a difference, and that's what the CardioMEMS Champion Trial show. So it's a wonderful vindication for the proof of concept that hemodynamics matter. And the second thing, as Dan did show you, is that you know the Champion Trial was a very well-designed trial, in my opinion. It, it got a lot of trouble with the FDA for, for a lot of reasons I won't go into, but the problem always was about the attentional control. And you know, it's not a blinded trial. I mean, it's not a, a, it's not a placebo controlled trial. But in the champion trial, when you notified a patient who had the device that you, was in the active monitoring group and told them to change their PA, ch change their medications, you had to call two patients that were in the passive group. Hey, are you really okay? You're sure you're feeling okay? I mean, they did everything they could to minimize bias for intervention more in the group that had the active monitoring device. And, despite, and with that, there was a 35% reduction in admissions. Now, in our real world experience, we combined the attentional approach, obviously, because there's no blinding, right? So we got double the effect that we got in Champion. And this is, the, this is what Dan just showed you is the real world experience multi-center at this point. There's nothing else out there. 
And it shows you that when you combine the attention, which I think is a big part of it, you know, with the device monitoring, you can get double the results. And that's important, and we hope this paper gets accepted soon, because a lot of people were skeptical. They said, well, in the real world, you won't beat, you know, because you're doing the attention before and after. But in fact, we did, and the centers that did, we collectively, and the, through the people participating here. So I think it's, it's, it's very, very powerful intervention. But you do have to pick your patients as, in terms of the practicalities. You know, a non-compliant patient is not somebody for this technology. The technology is best in somebody who's been doing their damnedest to take everything that they can and do everything they can to stay out of the hospital. And then you put this in, and, and it really starts to help. And I can tell you the feedback from patients is just awesome. I mean, they love it. Uh, we have more than nine now. This was about a year ago. And they, they love it because... Uh, they feel that you are watching their back continuously. And, and so the sense of security and involvement that it gives them uh, is quite impressive. And I've heard that from people around the country too. So I think patients like it, you know, they, they, and, and while we hope to show a reduction in, in clinic admissions, in clinic visits as well on this analysis, which had never been investigated before, it may be because it was too early in the game to see this, but I can tell you, that in our heart failure clinic, the people that, are, that have the device don't come to clinic as much. I mean, what's the main reason you come to heart failure clinic? To check the volume status and make sure the patient's not going to get decompensated, assuming they're on a, on a glide path, steady glide path with their med other medications. So you don't have to do that. Once you, once you actually know the pressures, you don't have to see them so often. And I would think for a place like Abbott, this might be even more helpful because you have a lot of patients that don't live here. And so by having these devices available to your referring physicians 50 or 100 miles away, you know, it might be very, very helpful. And this is something that's starting to be explored around the country, the use of this in, in remote sites. So that's just a practical point you might want to think about. But, you know, we're still at the beginning of the story. Uh, I am a consultant and speaker for St. Jude, so I've been around the country some, and I've learned there's a lot of regional variability in the use of this because of reimbursement but it's getting better. Uh, the number needed to treat, just so you know, now that the FDA, since the FDA took a little bit of time to get this out, they had 18 months of controlled follow-up. The number needed to treat is two. One implant, two, two implants, one admission at 18 months. So that's better than anything else I know of in, in the heart failure field, and that was all comers. If you went back and just looked at the control data in the early period for the follow-up for the primary endpoint, it was 50% uh, was reduction in HEF-PEF and about 30% reduction in HEF-REF. So as Dan mentioned, this is the only intervention that has been shown to change any measure of outcome, unless you're a top cat patient that doesn't live in Eastern Europe uh, <laughs> with, with HEF-PEF. So, uh, and I think statistically around the country, it's focusing because heart failure clinics see mostly HEF-REF, and, you know, we're not getting out there into the, into the community as much with the hep test patients. So the last point I'll make is, in terms of patient selection, remember that in the CHAMPION trial, we weren't looking for necessarily high recidivist type patients. It's class three symptoms, which can be almost anybody, depending on how you define it, and then admission within one year. That's it. That's who got into the studies. So just like with the Novartis drug with Entresto, if you only look at the sickest patients, you may or may not get the best results. This is prevented therapy. This is prevented therapy. So ideally, who you should be looking for are people who conform to the champion data set, which was class three wins an admission within the last year. And these weren't necessarily people that you see at an Abbott Northwestern end stage heart failure clinic but they are patients that are seen in every other primary care and secondary kind of clinic uh, everywhere. So I think as people get more familiar with it and start to appreciate the potential benefits in this more general cardiac heart failure population, you're gonna see this improve, you're gonna see utilization improve. But uh, at this point, uh, uh, we are very impressed and, and this analysis uh, exceeded my wildest expectations as to what the, the data might actually show and we are hopeful to get a second year of funding from St. Jude Abbott uh, so that we can double these numbers. We have double the number of implants now. More sites are coming online within the consortium, and we hope to get longer follow-up because we'd like to see if this, if this effect stays robust out to a second year. 
So thanks uh, again to Dan for putting this together. And we've got plenty of time for questions for me or for Dan or comments from your group. Yeah, I'd love to know if uh, anybody over here at Abbott has had any experience with the cardiomans patients, if they were happy, if they thought it helped them. It looks like a very cool uh, technology. I was wondering when you looked at the data, like, I don't know, 12 at Abbott and 50 sure. um, elsewhere, did you look at the different sites and see if that changed their admission rates? Like, uh, let's, you know, I'm not sure. Is it there? So this is, a, and again, I apologize, the table is very busy, but I wanted to give you guys as much of the absolute numbers as we could. Here we have it divided by sites. Um, and to look at the site key, it's here over all the way on the right. Uh, so for example, if uh, you're from here, from Abbott, and you want to say, well, how did we do? You would say, well, we had 15 patients at that point. And uh, you would look at your site three there, where I put the first arrow. And uh, you know there wasn't a lot of events. Um, so we did not reach statistical significance on either heart failure or total at Abbott in particular. But when you look at the absolute numbers, your heart failure admits went from 27 to 11. Um, so I think what happened here is we just did not have enough follow-up data yet. We did not have enough patients and enough events yet. Uh, but I think the absolute numbers are showing a trend. Um, now, by site, some sites reached statistical significance even by themselves. Uh, you know, if you look at the site that had the most events, for example, site number one, uh, they had 75 heart failure admissions before implant, 10 heart failure admissions uh, after implant. So, you know, they were able to reach statistical significance by themselves. So, so this is this is a power thing, I think. You know, the, the event rates, were, we're number one. We have the fewest implants, but that's Hannah. You know, look at the number of admissions given our patient population. And I think that's a whole separate question. But if you look at the five kinds of hospitals here, they're quite different. Uh, obviously, the power of the overall experience is mostly driven by Sanford and, and St. Cloud. But even a small experience at Hennepin, which is why our administrators are so excited about this, they keep calling me, <clears throat> why aren't you putting in more of these? Because this is a, you know, our population with compliance issues and stuff, you know, is a small number of, of, of the implants, but a huge impact on, on the uh, economics of our heart failure program. We, we got between this and our nurse navigator, we got our admission rate down from 26 to 13 percent in the 12 months. So it, it, it's a tool that's a very valuable tool in, in, in preventing. And by the way, this is talking about admissions, you know, not readmissions. Uh, it's, a, it's, a sub, it's a data that we want to get if we can get this out longer because in the CardioMEMS champion database, there is a paper showing that the patients that were admitted with active management had a huge reduction in readmissions. And I've proposed that as a trial for St. Jude to fund that they have not elected to fund at this point because it's already on label, but you know, and nobody wants to mess up an indication. <laughs> but I, I, I think my, my own sense is that the best time to get these patients is when they're hot. Get them while they're in the hospital and motivated, you know, assuming they're going to be compliant, you think, and then try to get it implanted, if not while they're in the hospital, at least within the next week after, so you have some sense of what they look like when they're hemodynamically stable. Peter. I think this is a great talk. Thank you. Thank um, you. A few comments. Um, first of all, before I forget, to your point, Steve, I think getting people when they're in the hospital is potentially ideal, but the re there's a substantial reimbursement disadvantage for inpatient implants. So we try to avoid that, quite honestly. Um, I th my take on this is I think we're, we're probably underutilizing this technology, and I think it really does have good potential, and I think this is important work. I, I hope you're successful getting it published because it, just a few weeks ago there was a series of about 2,000 published in circulation of kind of the first real-world experience, and that showed that the PA pressure decreases were even bigger than they were in the trial. There's also a paper in press at Jack that, that's available online um, looking at Medicare patients, who that's the pool that we've been able to get it paid for. We've had a lot of trouble locally. The non-Medicare patients aren't often reimbursed. Um, St. Jude has applied for national coverage determination, so that may change it. But for now, it's really the Medicare patients are the only ones that we're having consistent success in getting it paid for. But this other paper in Jack that, uh, again, is available online, looks at about 1,000 patients, and they looked at all the claims database for Medicare and found about a $7,000 uh, per year savings 
uh, of implants. So I think there's a growing uh, amount of data supporting the financial viability of it. To be honest, that's been one of the, the, the concerns or one of the reasons we've been a little more conservative about the implants is we had some substantial questions and concerns about whether or not we were actually getting reimbursed for putting these devices in. I think the other thing that we as a program have, I don't want to say struggled with, but have been really trying to find our way is two factors. One is getting people probably earlier, and I think that's where we've hit, we haven't seen as much of a benefit, at least in this data. Um, the other thing is people, if they're already on 400 milligrams a day of torsamide, this isn't going to help. <laughs> um, or if their creatinine's three and a half. Um, so that, that's a thing you have to be careful not to, you know, it's not going to be a value when they're already, you know, ESRD practically. Um, so that's a factor in, in terms of selection. Um, compliance is important. Um, there are patients that don't like the idea of something implantable, um, and that the vest you alluded to, that smile vest, we're in that study. We're the second leading enroller, so we have, I think, well, it's, uh, Kelly, I don't know if she's here. We've had 15 or 16 patients. They haven't all had the vest, although we've had a lot that have. Um, and that also brings up the, the issue of, uh, and this is a comment Lynn Warner-Stevenson from Brigham has made in a couple of settings is, you know, we always talk about the number needed to treat, but we have to also keep in mind the number needed to treat patients. And that particularly in the early period after this has been implanted, it's a lot of extra work. It's a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of back and forth. And so there is an intensification of management up front that we've seen both with the vest, which is a very parallel. It's the same concept, whether it's total fluid content or PA pressures, you're really titrating for that. Um, but that, that's something that we also have had, uh, I would say, um, we haven't found the right solution yet for how to uh, have a sort of a structured management program that lets us manage, you know, there are centers that have 50, 60 patients. You, you can't have somebody looking at 50 patients a day um, and not have a burden on your clinical staff. So I think those are some of the things that as a program, that we're working on, and that obviously centers have worked through it, and so I think we're probably a little behind where some people are in this regard. Um, but I think it is a, an interesting technology, and I'm eager to see how it continues to evolve. I think one of the big parts of, uh, of uh, the follow-up, like you mentioned, that I think was the biggest worry most people had. Um, the, the alert system where you don't have to look daily certainly helps uh, with people's concerns, but you're absolutely right the reimbursement for the device checks is not going to allow you to hire a cardiomem specialist who just focuses on that. It's, it's, it's so, you know, clinics are using their heart failure nurse practitioners and their clinical coordinators to try to fill in that need. Nice talk, Dan. Um, one question. You, uh, most of this therapy is diuretic driven. And so why would you therefore think that mortality might change if Really, all we're doing is diuresing patients. Yep. So I'm I'm skeptical that it'll be you know your Lasix that's going to necessarily help someone, um, but I think the people that have brought up a mortality theory, which I don't I haven't quite bought into yet, but I think it's certainly possible. Um, I think the theory they've come up with is that this recurrent congestion or chronic subclinical congestion. Uh, is leading to increased uh, myocardial cell death. It's leading to worsening renal failure over the course of time. Uh, on top of that, you have patients that are going from dry to very congested, getting aggressive uh, diuresis, some of them developing AKI um, while they're in the hospital, and having other hospital complications that come with just, you know, hanging out in the hospital. Um, I don't think it'll necessarily be that diuretic that you're given, um, but I think if, if it truly improves care and hemodynamics uh, the way that some people think it will, um, you could certainly see a change in the numbers just almost, almost uh, as a rebound to, to preventing their admissions and their episodes of congestion. Another theory I've heard about that is, and I may have this wrong, but the changes that were made in Champion, I think it was two-thirds were increases in diuretics and a third were decreases. And so that's the other part of this we often don't think about is that this is also valuable in telling you when someone is euvolemic or even hypovolemic and you should back off their diuretics and maybe 
what you need to do is increase their other neurohormonal antagonists and that their renal function is worse because they're on too much diuretic, you back off the diuretic, you can increase their ACE inhibitor. So that's another plausible mechanism by which it might improve mortality, but I agree it's too early to say. Champion is that most of the patients that on the active group had an increase, uh, but you're right, there were some that were decreased, and there was also an uptick in the use of nitrates and up titration of neural hormonal blockage. And there is a paper Abraham's published a, a modeling paper that looks that would pr pr project of survival benefit, but but it's based on you know modeling and things we know. But I think as much as I as much as most of you know how much I detest ferrosamide and and uh, uh, at this point you know Mike Felker's paper is the evil necessary a necessary evil. Uh, watch for the paper I should have coming out shortly about the uh, need for an alternative approach. Uh, but, you know, I think that at some level, one of the big questions we don't know uh, is whether congestion itself, as you're implying, is a problem or how we're decongesting patients. I think it's both. I mean, I think there's no question that these increased bouts of wall stress are <laughs> bad for the left ventricle. And, and every study has shown this, you know. If you look at patients admitted for it, you can't find any differences between them and the patients that aren't admitted, but afterwards their mortality rate skyrockets. So, so this idea that recurrent admissions, which are congestion driven, uh, is causing a deleterious effect to left ventricular function and remodeling perhaps is, is a very open hypothesis, I think. It's not proven, but, it's, but it's, it's a very open and reasonable question. And the real question then is if we have different ways to treat it, should we Treated. And one of the studies that we proposed with this device, unfortunately, that did not get funded was to randomize people at admission to diuretics or ultrafiltration and then continue the randomizations to ultrafiltration or diuretics using the PA pressure. And then that would, that would test a little bit, you know, and, and a control arm that didn't get funded at the NIH level yet. But I'm going to try the same thing maybe but with Tolvapid. But anyway, the, um, I, I just can't believe, I'm, I'm sorry, after... 36 years on staff and almost 39 now as a fellow or staff, I cannot believe that allowing wall stress and filling pressure to rise and then body slamming the patients with high doses of, you know, as we say when they commit, I can't believe that's good for you. <laughs> I simply cannot believe it. And while it may be difficult to prove, the nice thing is that we, we may have a tool here that could allow us to test this probably with a non-invasive future iteration because it's a big unanswered question. Thank you. Anybody else? I, just, uh, I mean, that might be a devil's advocate question or so, but uh, since the concern is admission and readmission, right? So it always feels to me like we're, we're inventing a new device to change things. So here's my question. If you would put a heart failure specialist or PA in an ED, would you then also Avoid admissions or readmissions? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, but, but it's, and that gets to the issue. I don't think this is about admissions. I mean, this is being driven by money, you know, by economics, but the, but should be being driven by care, as I've just said. So I think you could head off the admissions, but my guess is you might not be getting the, the benefit for which admissions are a surrogate, preventing these decongestive episodes, because they'd already have it by the time they get to the ED, it's a problem. And, and you'll have a lot of people that on this curve are right at minus one or minus two, you know, the congestion has already started and it, a lot of them are already on their way. Thank you, everybody. Sorry we ran a little bit late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm glad you were able to make it. <laughs>